Good evening. I'm going to give a minute or two more for everyone to uh, to come, uh, and then we'll uh, get started. I want to first start off by thanking everybody for spending your time this evening with us at Argonne Medical. Uh, to kind of kick things off, my name is Dr. Peter Stibbs. I'm the Director of Global Clinical Services and Physician Education for Argonne Medical, as well as a practicing interventionist in the United States. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to have your time this evening. Uh, hopefully you find it's worth it, uh, and I definitely am looking forward to uh, doing a little teaching tonight. Uh, we're going to be discussing the topic of transjugular liver biopsy specifically transjugular liver biopsy utilizing the T-Lab biopsy system. Uh, when we look at transjugular, transjugular is a biopsy that's been performed since the 1970s. The very first transjugular liver biopsy was actually performed at the Oregon Health Science Center by Charles Dodder and, and Dr. Roche, and that was in 1978. So we're talking about a technique that's been around for quite some time. And historically, we haven't had any real changes in the technology we've utilized. Uh, since the early 1980s, when the original lab system of medical was brought to the market for transjugular liver biopsy. Uh, now we have uh, other systems that are out there, particularly the one that I'm going to discuss is going to be the T-Lab system uh, from Argonne Medical. Um, but uh, there are some, some nuances that I want to talk about with the procedure. Uh, we're going to go over some of the basic anatomy and physiology of, of the case, some of the pathologic uh, you know, processes, and a lot of that should be basic for everyone on here. I know I have a lot of physicians and clinicians who are joining us this evening, so I won't beleaguer too much on that, but I will touch base on some of the specifics of the T-Lab system uh, so that you're more familiar with it, so that you understand it a little bit better. Uh, you'll notice that there's a chat box uh, on this and a question and answers. If you have any questions throughout the, the program, please feel free to type them into that question and answer box. And I will, at the end of this presentation, endeavor to get them and answer everybody's question. So I just want to once again thank you for coming up today. We're going to start by talking about transjugular liver biopsy, anatomy, and the procedure itself. Um, so I want to touch base this evening on anatomy, indications for the procedure, and the procedure itself with regards to uh, the rhythm and, and the steps for performance. Now I caveat, this is how I do the procedure. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's completely, uh, completely uh, the way you may do the procedure, and that's okay. I think these steps that I'm going to point out are pretty basic, whether you're using the T-Lab system or whether you're using the Prince Lab system. And I do caveat, I've used both of them. And in our practice here at the U in the US, we do have both systems available to us and we kind of use them equally. Um, but I will explain why I prefer using the T-Lab system over the lab system uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, so even though these steps are my steps, they should be universal for most of you as well. So let's talk about some of the indications for transgender. Um, the indications, you know, basically very basic. We're trying to diagnose grade and stage of progression of general liver disease. Uh, most people do not use this for target biopsy. I have actually seen a couple and I have some partners that have performed target biopsy via transjugular, but in the end, the majority of the time, this is used as a general liver biopsy uh, technique. Uh, specifically, uh, you're dealing, you know, with these patients that are dealing with cirrhosis, you know, scarring and when we look at cirrhotic disease, what are the culprits of cirrhosis? You know, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Um, we do these for liver transplant patients that deal with cirrhotic uh, liver, as well as looking at the liver to make sure that they're not getting liver rejection. Uh, in patients that have ascites, that's non-refractory, in other words, you drain it and it keeps coming back immediately. The risk of bleeding from a capsular puncture is much higher in these patients because there's no way for me to get general hemostasis by pressure. So in patients that have a large volume of ascites where performance of a paracentesis targeted procedure is not efficient, these patients would benefit from performance of the transjugular liver biopsy to reduce that risk. And then abnormal coagulation. This one's kind of a weird caveat because I know most patients that have liver disease are going to have some form of abnormal coagulation uh, due to the fact that the liver factors for, for fibrinization are, you know, basically that's where those factors are developed is in the liver. So when we talk about you know, performance of this procedure um, and we talk about uh, you know, abnormal coagulation, they tend to go hand in hand. 
Um, the upshot, once again, with an abnormal coagulation, if you have a really high bleeding factor, performing transjugular because it does allow bleed back into the venous system versus transcapsular, where I'm going to end up bleeding outside of the liver. Obviously, huge difference with regards to our ability to maintain hemostasis. So what's our indication? Uh, you know, indication, like I said, I always say indication is relative because it's relative to you. In your practice, you might perform biopsies or perform a transjugular liver biopsy, and there might be some differences in why I would perform it on a different patient. But I tried to go over just some of the basic indications. I, I reference the Society of Interventional Radiology with regards to these indications that I'm going to cite right now. But every, every place is a little bit different, and your indication for performance might be a little bit different, and that's okay. Um, so, you know, why do we perform transjugular coagulopathy issues, as I stated earlier, ascites, but Chiari syndrome uh, is another uh, patient type of syndrome where, you know, you're having vascular anomaly. Uh, it's much easier to transect uh, a vascular plane you don't want to go through in a but Chiari patient. Uh, going transjugular makes it for a safer biopsy. In massive obesity, when you're dealing with patients that you're dealing with a large panis or a large distance between the liver organ, and the external uh, performing on a massive patient, you may be limited to the size of your biopsy needle. Biopsy needles only go so, so long. Uh, the majority of them are the longest ones I've ever seen. We're about 25 centimeters or 30 centimeters. So in a patient that is a very large patient, you may not be able to get to the liver uh, going, you know, percutaneously or going, you know, from external using you know, ultrasound. So in this patient, a massively obese patient, performance of transjugular would give you the ability to go from inside and actually get the specimen. So that is, though it's rare, that is an indication and one of the things that we perform these biopsies on larger patients. Um, if you perform a percutaneous biopsy and you fail to get tissue, another indication. Uh, vascular tumors, um, uh, peliosis of hepatitis, thrombocytopenia, amyloidosis, all these things are, are certainly reasons. But one of the big reasons for me in doing a transjugular liver biopsy versus doing a standard percutaneous liver biopsy is the fact that I can get hemodynamic pressures. So in a patient that we're grading for liver failure or in a patient that's already had a transplant liver, obtaining pressures ahead of time is gonna allow me to be able to determine exactly how that liver is functioning and how that portal pressure is being affected by the liver disease. I can't do that with a percutaneous biopsy. So there is an advantage not only of, you know, the safety advantage and these other reasons that we do the transjugular biopsy, but more importantly is in all these transjugular liver biopsies, I also have the ability because I'm already in the vascular space, I'm already in that hepatic vessel to be able to wedge it and get a, a hemodynamic pressure. That's going to help hepatology grade disease and understand the level of failure and how that portal pressure is being affected. I think it's an important add on to the procedure. Uh, what are the contraindications? All these are relative contraindications, um, but <clears throat> certainly are, are something that you can take to measure. Uh, you know, a patient with a thrombosis internal jugular vein, that's relative because there are other vessels to be able to get access into the, the hepatic vein, so that's truly a relative contraindication. If a patient has untreated bacterial disease, um, fungal or parasitic infections, once again, seeding is always an issue anytime you perform a biopsy, you perform transjugular, so you'd want to treat those patients properly in control and not going to be a factor if you go in and do the biopsy. And then, you know, if you have a patient that has an allergy diet and agent contrast medium, you may have to consider other methodologies. Um, you can perform transjugular biopsy not only using fluoroscopy, uh, you can do it uh, with fluoroscopy guidance in using ice imaging, uh, which is a form of intracardiac ultrasound. You can go transhepatic if the patient is small enough, you can go and actually get a transabdominal ultrasound. And then obviously CO2 as a medium in the liver has been explored uh, quite readily. Uh, if you look up and refer to Dr. Dick Hawkins and his research in CO2 medium contrast in the liver, you'll see that there's plenty of cases of utilizing CO2 specifically, similar to how we do TIPS procedures. You can use CO2 to highlight the hepatic vein. It also fills through the, the um, the, uh, down through the uh, sinusoids and goes into the portal vein as well. So you really get a good understanding of the anatomy of the liver vascularity using CO2. It also, like I said, can be utilized in patients that do have a history of reaction, diatonated contrast. <clears throat> and so there, even though these are contraindications, we consider them all relative. So why transjugular liver biopsy? You know, why, why would I perform it? Well, we know it's performed less commonly in percutaneous liver biopsy. 
due to the fact that it needs to be performed by an interventional physician. Uh, transjugular liver biopsy in general is performed by people that have invasive endovascular percutaneous experience, whereas transabdominal, uh, general, you know, general IR, uh, some hepatologists, some pathologists uh, here in the U.S. perform uh, general liver biopsies in their office. Uh, but when we talk about transjugular, we're talking about procedure that's generally performed by interventional specialists. Um, so, you know, and, and one of those advantages, like I said, when we talk about it, is it doesn't puncture the liver capsule, which is very important due to that risk of, of bleeding. Uh, so in patients where you deal with coagulopathy issues, your main biopsy source in a coagulopathic patient should always be transjugular biopsy if it's possible due to that mitigation of risk of bleeding. So we're just going to go through some of the basic steps. Um, like I said, this is how I do it. Uh, it doesn't mean it has to be how you do it. Everyone can, does it a little bit differently. Um, but what I generally do is I try to give the algorithm of step-by-step -step of how we use this, this device, this lab device. And then we'll go over some of the specifics and some of the comparatives to the, uh, to the flip device. Uh, but what I generally do is I would gain access uh, going in with an 035 wire. You know, I'm gonna go down and, and I take my catheter down into the IVC past where I know the ostium of the hepatic vein is. And I like to use an MPA catheter you. I know people who selectively use an RDC catheter or like to use a Cobra. Uh, an MPA just seems to have the angulation or a Compi uh, seems to have the angulation that finds the ostium of the hepatic vein easier for me. And if you look at how most hepatic veins come off, so they basically are coming down a little bit anterior and certainly going down, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a, an angulation, that MPA almost fits perfectly uh, to the angulation of most hepatic vein takeoffs. So I like to use a five French MPA. I take it down past the ostium, and then I will just drag it up slowly until it gauges the ostium of the hepatic vein. Uh, once I find that hepatic vein, I'll give a little puff of contrast to confirm I'm where I'm at. I'm not using the type of ancillary veins that I don't want to be in. Uh, once I've con confirmed that I'm where I'm at, I'm going to drive a guide wire down. I like to use a Benson wire. I like to use something with a little more rigidity and a little more body to carry the device through and into the hepatic vein. Once again, it's, it's dealer's choice with regards to that. However, you like to practice whatever the wires that you feel comfortable with are perfectly fine. I know people like to use the stiff glide wire uh, when they transition into the hepatic vein. Uh, people that use the Benson wire or, or you know, or a Dossi that is basically using a Bueller wire. Uh, it, it really is up to you, but I like something with a little bit of rigidity because if you think about it, I'm taking down a hard cannula. Uh, so that's a metallic internal cannula. Uh, that's in the cannula for performance that you place the biopsy device through. Uh, so transition that hard cannula. If I have a floppy wire, as I'm trying to drive it down into the right hepatic vein, what can happen is that it can pull the wire out. It'll buttress the wire out. But if I have something stiffer with more rigidity, like a Amplatz wire, it won't do that uh, more readily. It'll follow that track down to the wire. So that's why I like to use a stiffer wire for this procedure. Um, so then we talk about the introduction of the device. I like to use, and, and everyone's a little bit different, I will put a nine French sheath um, into the, the jugular vein and place that nine French in there. And then I will transition my seven French device through it. Everyone's a little bit different. I know people that will go in bare without a, a sheath in the jugular and actually go right in with the introducer sheath uh, for the biopsy set. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. Once again, I'm not trying to change your practice pattern I'm just explaining why I do what I do and then explaining some of the nuances of this device. Uh, so what I will say is that uh, you can obviously go in. Uh, I know people that will take an MPA sheath down. So they actually take a curved sheath down so they maintain the curve uh, for easier access in the hepatic vein. Uh, that being stated, whatever you want to do is fine. Uh, as long as you put a sheath in or you have access that can be maintained in the jugular. Uh, if you don't have a sheath in, you just have to be very careful that you always maintain your wire purchase into that, into that right hepatic vein, because if you pull it out, you're gonna have some issues. You're gonna have to go back in from, with the MPA and try to reaccess. Uh, so basically over the wire, we'll place the, uh, the cannula. And basically you can see the seven French cannula has a marking band on the end. So I can see exactly where the tip of this device is. And I'll place it over the wire and take it down and transition it into the hepatic vein. Uh, so once I'm in the hepatic vein and I've accessed in, I know I'm where I want to be at. What I like to do at that point is once you're in the hepatic vein, I'm introducing the device, I will actually rotate anterior. And you'll notice on this specific device, there's actually a little red marker uh, with an arrow that goes up. As I'm in place and I reach into the hepatic vein, I'll come in and the device will be kind of going off towards the side, to the right. 
right side. I'm going to slowly rotate anterior. So I'm going to be going into the vessel like this, and I'm going to rotate anterior. And by rotating anterior, obviously, I'm pushing the, the, the sheath or that introducer towards the liver itself to the parenchyma so that when I introduce and I slide my needle in, it's going to go straight into the parenchyma. That gives me less risk of having a capsular rupture and going out the side of the liver where it's a little bit thinner. And by pushing it anterior, it's going to give me into the meat of the, of the parenchyma where I really want to get that specimen. Um, and once I do that, like I said, I'm going to push it anterior. Guide wire is going to be out. You want to make sure that you cock your, your device on the outside of the body. Um, so cock it at the back table and you're going to introduce the needle in. Um, and specifically with this system, what you'll notice, and this is very important, uh, I have colleagues of mine that have utilized the system. And if they don't utilize it correctly, sometimes they'll have issues getting a specimen. And what it is, and you'll have the same issue with Cook actually, you want to make sure that when you put the system in, there's a red handle here, and it corresponds to a red mark, a little arrow. I'll do that little red arrow here. That correspondence tells me that when I open up my needle, that that one's going to be up, and the trough of the of the side notch of this needle is going to be up. So when I introduce my system, I like to introduce it literally red to red, and make sure that I'm, I have that needle up. And then as I slowly introduce the system, there's a little mark here. You'll see it's, it's going to be blue or black. Uh, when that mark is basically brought to the safety funnel, that tells me my needle is right at the edge of, of the system itself, and that's ready to be deployed. So once I get it into place and I get it down to this blue, I know it's ready to go. At that point, I'm going to push that trocar needle out and introduce it into the parenchyma, keeping the needle anterior. So keeping it turned anterior, I kind of push it out, which introduces it. Now, this is very important. This part I find does make a difference in the biopsy. Uh, as I perform the biopsy, I open up the notch, but instead of just clicking it very quickly, and a lot of us do that, we literally will just kind of push it in, and here you can kind of see a demonstration on the screen of the needle. We kind of push the needle and kind of slam the plunger down very quick. I like to wait a second or two. And why I do that is it gives time for the liver tissue to prolapse into the side notch, and we, hopefully you can see that okay. There's a side notch in here of this needle that captures the tissue. By giving it a second or two to sit into this notch, it allows that tissue to relax. Because you're dealing with cirrhotic tissue, it's already going to be very hard, very fibrotic. Uh, so it gives it a second or two to relax inside of that notch. And then once that happens, I always make sure this is completely pushed in. I want it so I can't push that needle any farther forward. Uh, once that happens, that's when I'll finally fire the device and take my specimen. I found that giving it that second or two to allow the tissue to prolapse does make a difference in the quality of specimen. And I've actually confirmed that with pathology, uh, where I've taken tissue samples that were very quick and just kind of fired them off. And then waited a second or two to allow that tissue to prolapse. I seem to, seem to find in those samples, I have less fragmentation. So that's just a little tip. I, like I said, you're gonna do things the way you need to do them. Um, but what I have found in both this set as well as the cook set is that if I give it a second or two for that tissue to prolapse, it does make a difference in the specimen quality. And so kind of going through this, and I think I, I, I've talked to uh, these points already. Um, and once, once we're done, like I said, we generally have passed, at least in my institution, I'll take three to four specimens uh, doing that same technique of leaving that needle in place, leaving the side notch open, uh, letting that tissue, you know, kind of slide into the device and then take my specimen. Also of importance throughout the process is I want to make sure as I'm taking that biopsy with this device, anterior approach, uh, that as I turned it and I, I turned that needle anterior into the liver, that I keep that throughout the performance of the procedure. In fact, I keep my hand on here and what I will do is I'll take the needle out and I'm lucky I'll normally have my assistant with me and have them remove the specimen uh, out of that side notch. You want to keep that anterior turn because a lot of times we'll start letting it kind of drift down and fall down and you're literally taking that needle and you're allowing the shift out of the liver. Uh, so you really want to keep it anterior throughout the whole process. And so I just make it a habit to keep that completely turned, keeping the pressure on the system. And you'll feel it'll want to keep trying to buttress and kind of fall down. I always maintain that anterior approach and anterior pressure throughout the system. Uh, that'll generally give me better biopsies and also reminds me to not let become what I call lazy, basically not let it kind of fall back. I keep it anterior throughout the, the process. Um, these are kind of some of the sets. Uh, what I do like about the system and we'll talk about is, and you can kind of see here the side notch uh, that the tissue prolapses into. There's some interesting things about this system that make it a little bit different than the cook system uh, that can lead to better quality specimens. 
Hey, uh, Pete. And certainly. Pete? Hey, yes. Catherine, sorry to interrupt you. Um, your audio is going in and out, so I'm not sure if it's your hand is covering it. So just. I, I think it might be the. Uh, I haven't been covering it. Maybe it's the microphone. Okay. All right. I hope it's not a microphone issue. Can you hear no, me okay? Not. Yep. No, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll try to slow down. Yeah. No Maybe it's having a hard time catching up. So sorry about that. I apologize. Apparently, we're having some audio. Um, so what are the keys to procedural success? Uh, with this device specifically, hub to hub, I want to make sure that this device is completely inserted into the hub so that the needle itself reaches that safety bubble and stays hub to hub. If you fire it and it's completely back a little bit or it's not completely all the way into the device, what will happen is you're foreshortening. You're firing it within the, the cannula itself, and so I'm not going to get the same quality to Second thing is red to red. I want to make sure this red portion of the needle faces this red. That allows me to know that my needle is open. That's going to allow that tissue to prolapse into the, the needle itself. It's going to give me better specimen in the long term. And like I said, I've seen that anecdotally. Uh, I certainly, uh, I work very closely with our pathologists on all these samples. I want to make sure the specimens are quality for them. And so I challenge you, if you're using the system, uh, talk to your pathologist, find out exactly what uh, versus other devices you've used. I think you'll find that you're going to get better specimens utilizing that T-Lab device. At least that's what I've experienced. And that's what a lot of us have seen. There's actually some clinical studies out there that support that. Uh, you don't want to bend the, the needle too too much. And, what, and I know we all bend it. And sometimes it's absolutely necessary to bend the shaft of the introducer uh, to be able to kind of meet that angulation to push the device out into the liver. But what can happen if you bend this too much and you put too much of an acute bend, you can place kind of a, a real acute bend in the middle of the shaft. And that puts a lot of pressure on this needle to be able to fire. And what it does is it introduces friction on the needle handle, which can actually prevent the needle from firing. So it's important that when you bend, I like to make a nice smooth bend. I don't kind of just take it and crank it. I will literally run my hand along it and slowly create the bend that I want to give it a little more angulation. Uh, but I, it's important that I go around the whole body of the device versus just taking and giving it a quick bend. Uh, because when you, like I said, when you do that, you'll, you'll find that you can break the shaft of the needle and also it'll add a lot of friction into the system. Uh, and then there's a safety funnel. Now this safety funnel can be removed, uh, but when you do that, what happens is you foreshorten the length uh, of the needle to get to the outside. And plus this is designed to prevent you from having your hand getting poked with these devices. And as we know, the majority of these patients are dealing with problems like hepatitis, dealing with disease states that, that are certainly communicable. So we want to make sure that we're, we're safe. And so that, that funnel is actually preventing you from poking your hand, uh, giving yourself uh, some sort of infection. So I think it's important you leave the safety funnel on. And just maintain, as we said, when you're holding pressure on this and I'm pushing it forward, I'm going to make sure that I maintain that anterior positioning, uh, poking out into the liver. I try not to let it fall back and kind of just prolapse and then go back in. I always want to maintain that pressure and you'll feel it. It'll be pressure in your hand as you're pushing it anterior into the wall of the hepatic vein. You want to make sure you maintain that anterior pressure. So we're going to go to, and I promise to get all your, uh, your questions answered. Uh, once again, these are the advantages of performing a transjugular biopsy. Uh, I make sure I go in and I'll get pressures. Uh, most of the time when I'm doing this, I will just take an MPA catheter. I'll wedge the MPA in and get my pressures right through the MPA catheter in the hepatic vein. Uh, some people will actually go in, they'll use a balloon catheter and obstruct and get a true wedge. Um, both of them work well. I haven't seen much of a differentiation between using my MPA to get a pressure versus using a true balloon catheter. But once again, I'll leave that to you to make that decision on whether you want to use a balloon assisted wedge or just kind of wedge your MPA in. Uh, where I'm at, I don't like to waste a lot of different supplies. Uh, so I find that just using the MPA that comes with the set works well for me. Um, but if you want to use a balloon catheter and that's the way you're used to doing your wedge pressures, and that works as well. Um, so we're going to talk about the T-Lab specifically. Uh, these are some of the features and benefits of this kit and what I find in comparison to Cook. And like I said, I've used both sets uh, in practice, uh, but this is the one that I kind of prefer, which is why I'm talking about it today. Um, you know, 
the kit comes complete. You, you have your needle in an 18 gauge or 19 gauge. The system itself is 65 centimeters. Uh, the device is 20 millimeter throw. And, and basically uh, you get a seven French sheet that comes with it. Um, it has a metal stiffener that allows you to be able to torque that device anterior. And it does come with these neat little swabs. These swabs actually uh, allow you to be able to remove your specimen without having fragmentation. Um, a lot of times we'll either try to wash it off in the formalin or we're sitting there at the back table, especially if the tissue is really soft. We'll be trying to uh, kind of push that tissue off the, uh, the, the, the notch, the side notch, whereas these swabs actually will allow you to roll the tissue off gently and place them in your, your formalin without fragmentation. order numbers. So what's the differentiation between this device and the clip device? What I find is the needle is a much more flexible needle. In dealing in cirrhotic tissue, I'm not dealing with normal healthy liver parenchyma. And sometimes that flexibility of the needle, especially when I'm trying to make really acute curves, because the disposition of the hepatic vein tends to change as that liver shrinks and it becomes cirrhotic. The ability to make your device flex into the hepatic vein and out into the parenchyma can this device, device was designed with fenestrations around the needle to create a very flexible needle. Uh, it's a much more flexible needle, in my opinion, than the Cook alternative version. And that does allow to really make some acute angulations with this needle that you wouldn't be able to do in general with the standard metallic Cook needle um, because it just won't be able to bend. And, and you can see in the bottom some images here. Uh, that's actually some of those fenestrations that allow you to be able to steer that needle. Um, so it really does help. Here you can see some of the touch points on this. Uh, it allows you to fire even in very twisted zones. And that's been my experience. Uh, it does have the safety funnel. It's a nice little add-on. It keeps your hands farther away from where you insert the needle into the hub of the sheath. So in these patients that have pathologic processes, most of the time hepatitis, uh, this reduces and cuts down hopefully on, need on needle, accidental needle sticks to the practitioner who's performing the biopsy. Um, so I think that's all important. Those are nice things to have that aren't currently on the kit set. Um, the needle tip, more importantly to me, is a trocar tip. Uh, so if you did the comparison, uh, when you look at the cook set, um, it is not. It's a bevel tip. The trocar tip was designed to push through cirrhotic tissue. I find in advancing this needle through really scarred tissue, really bad liver disease, seems a little bit easier to me. I get less uh, pushback, so it seems to migrate through the tissue easier than using a bevel style needle, which is uh, what the cook set is, uh, where I end up getting what we call skiving, where it drops as I'm trying to push it down or literally follow down, uh, this will push true. So if I'm going straight, that needle will push straight into the tissue versus actually dropping down. At least that's been my experience in utilization of this needle tip. Um, once again, it gives you that visual alignment. Uh, I think it's important when you use the device, you want to have that notch open and up so that tissue prolapse into it. Um, now, cook is the same thing. When you introduce the cook needle, you want to be able to have the needle where the bevel is up so that when the side notch opens up, the tissue just kind of falls into it and you're using gravity to aid that. Uh, but they don't really have a visualization. Um, you don't have any type of discoloration or visual markings to tell you when that is or which way the needle needs to be. Uh, this just gives you the kind of that visualization to allow you to be able to see that a little bit better. Um, and they have a radio opaque tip on the catheter, which I do like. Uh, on the cook system, you do not have a radio opaque tip. So sometimes when I'm in the portal vein, it can be difficult to see where the tip of my catheter is beyond the metal uh, cannula. Uh, with this radio opaque tip, it allows me to see specifically a lot easier as I'm kind of pushing the device into the hepatic vein. So for me, the visualization is optimized on this device in comparison to what I see with cook. Um, uh, full notch exposure. Uh, basically what you'll notice with this notch is that you don't have an overhang. Uh, now on the cook needle, there is a little bit of an overhang so that when you do take your biopsy, some of that tissue doesn't really, it's kind of a dead space. It's, it's a naked space that doesn't fill with tissue. That little bit of, of, of flat kind of no overhang allows the tissue to fill into that notch a little bit better, which also allows it to come out a little easier because I don't have to try to stake something down underneath that overhang to try to peel the tissue without having the overhang, it allows the tissue to be able to slide off your needle just a little bit easier. Uh, and then these tissue removal swabs. I like them, they come in the kit. 
It makes it really easy to literally just roll them out and, and you get four of them. So we do four specimens. So I can literally just take that and wash it right off in the foam roll and go. Uh, it does prevent some of the, the fracturing of the specimen that you'll have if you're trying to get it off with a, a needle or if you're using a, a blade, uh, trying to kind of peel that off. Uh, really, and also in the kind of that really soft tissue, it does a good job of rolling them off and they come standard the next day. Um, Radio, this marking band is nice because it will tell me basically when I look at this band, uh, when you're in the disposition that you see right there, uh, where the band is just meeting that safety funnel, uh, what you'll notice is that where this is and you have this mark, it basically will tell you right where the needle tip is at the end of your cannula. Uh, so when I have that needle disposition like this, I know that the needle is getting ready to push out. So I can actually stop and sure under fluoroscopy that I'm right where I want to be. I introduce the, the, uh, the needle into the liver peripheral. So once again, these are some niceties that are on the set that gives me optimal visualization and allows me to be able to see what's going on a little bit easier. Um, here's just some basic comparisons uh, when we talk about uh, Cook set versus the T-Lab. An interesting note is that uh, the company that made T-Lab um, before Argon, and Argon bought this back in 2000 and I think 12, 2013, the company that made the T-Lab device also made the lab's needle for Cook. Um, what happened is they looked at that needle and they, they wanted to do something to kind of update it. Uh, they looked at some of the physician complaints that people were having with the original lab system and said, hey, we can do some things that are a little bit different with this device. We can, you know, let's change the needle configuration to a trocar versus, a, you know, a bevel needle. Let's do some little things. At the time, Cook didn't want to invest in those changes. It wasn't really necessary because they were the only ones on the market. So since this company made the needle for Cook, they decided that they were going to make the improvements and make their own product. And that became the T-Lab system. So literally the T-Lab system is basically similar to the labs, but it's kind of an updated version of that Cook needle. Uh, making some of the changes by listening to physician feedback, things that physicians found were not really working too well with the, the lab set. They tried to make those changes in the T-Lab. Um, so T-Lab advantage, once again, needle flexibility, uh, safety funnel, uh, the tip itself is that trocar tip, you get the full notch exposure, uh, there's tissue swabs that come with it, it's a very flexible system, uh, and in comparison, as you can see, here's an, an example of flexing the needle uh, compared to the more rigid cook style. So I do find that in really uh, tortuous anatomy, uh, it's easier for me to get the needle in the parenchyma than it is to use the bludgeon. And you can see the safety funnel in comparison to the Cooks, which doesn't have one. And, and that really does make a difference. I don't like having my hand right up on the hub when I have a needle that could have bloodborne pathogen on there. It's very easy for me to nick my gloves or nick my hand. That safety funnel puts me at a good distance away. So it kind of gives me a little feeling of safety when I'm utilizing it. Um, here you can see the needle tip differentiation. Uh, once again, the lab system or the T-Lab system has that beveled tip. Uh, that allows it to puncture easier in the trocar. Um, you can see the side-by-side -side comparison to the Cook's lab set, which is a bevel tip, which tends to skive a little bit in really cirrhotic liver. So I do find access feels like there's less friction and less pushback when I use that T-Lab system versus using the Cook's lab system. And here you can see the difference in that full notch exposure. Uh, you have this little overhanging hook that sometimes can hold tissue and kind of get it held up in here, or won't have any tissue at all space. Uh, here you don't have that, so it's a little easier for you to be able to take your specimen out of the needle and allows that tissue to fill into that needle gap as well. Um, once again, radiopaque bands, so for optimization, they have a band on the Argon T-Lab, the Cook's Lab does not. Uh, and, you know, it comes with those, those tissue swabs, which do make it nice. Um, kind of going through these, I think I touched base on all of this. Uh, clinical data, there's a great study out there, and there's a lot of porosity. We do a lot of things in medicine that aren't what we consider, uh, you know, scientific, uh, you know, executed standards. And so we do a lot of procedures that there's not a whole lot of information on, especially older procedures. Something like transjugular liver biopsy has been around for a long time without any update in the equipment that we utilize. Uh, so when this new device, the T-Lab system, came out, uh, it was interesting that you know there was a couple studies that were done. This one was done at Rush University in Chicago, and Rush historically used a lot of uh, Cook devices, uh, but they decided to do a comparison between the Cook lab system and then this T lab system to see if there truly is a difference. Um, like I said, both systems are utilized in the system uh, at the hospital. Uh, this was done by four IRs, 
all of them have a lot of experience in performing transjugular and they all use the sets equally. So they would use the, the cook set and then the next set they would use would be the T-Lab. And so all the different uh, interventionalists use these devices. And what's good about the results or interesting about the results, when you look at fragmentation rate, and this is, you know, fragmentation really does tell you musical tissue for an unmusical tissue. Uh, you know, Cook's system of fragmentation had 24.9% fragmentation, uh, whereas the, the T-Lab only had 14.3. So less fragmentation with the T-Lab. We look at portal tri tracks, you know, CPTs, which is what we're trying to diagnose and what we need on our, our specimens anytime look at CPTs, you're going to see that argon uh, 12.2 plus you know, or minus 3.3 versus 10 plus or minus 4.6. So argon T-Lab actually had much more complete portal tracks in the specimens than the Cook set. Uh, and so when we look at adequacy for staging, which is the most important thing, because that's what we're doing when we get these tissue samples, and we're using them for staging and grading. Uh, with the lab set, it was 42.7%. Argon had 58.4%. So you're talking about, you know, looking at tissue quality, looking at specimen quality, the T-Lab had was superior in this study in comparison to the Cook lab set. And then we looked at rate of diagnosis of 94.9% for Cook and T-Lab was 98.7. So in all the metrics you're trying to look at that you want to be able to see what, how a device will function, uh, there was superiority shown in this study at Rush University for the T-Lab system. So I find that interesting because like I said, there's not a whole lot of new data and not a whole lot of data out there, period, on a technique that's been around since the 1970s. Uh, so this is kind of a newer study comparing the two technologies. Um, so just kind of going through what we what we discussed. Uh, but I want to share a couple of pictures. I, you know, this is a typical uh, transjugular liver biopsy utilizing the, uh, the uh, T-Lab system. And what you'll note here in the picture on my, uh, my right is that you're going to notice that you can see that full notch exposure. Uh, you can see the cap exposed. When you have that cook because of that overhang, sometimes you can't see that full exposure. Uh, in that case, you can. And here's another, just kind of another uh, picture utilizing the system. Uh, the key for me on this system really is making sure that I have this completely torqued anterior throughout the process. So I want to make sure that that needle is completely torqued and I maintain it being torqued. If I don't, I can sometimes have too much friction in the system. And I want to make sure with this system that I completely have it hub to hub. So it's not a little bit back and I'm firing it back off of that system. I want to make sure it's completely hub to hub before I fire it. Uh, and that really does make some differentiation to me. It gives me a quality specimen uh, that is pathologically superior to some of the ones that I've seen in the Cook system. So that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I wanted to not be eager too much on, uh, on the pathologic process and kind of get to the meat and potatoes in utilizing the Cook device. So I just wanted to give the comparative for this device, how I find works best, the tips and tricks that I kind of use to help me with this device. And I hope that you find it helps you. Uh, so I'm gonna open this up and kind of look for questions. I do see a couple of them. Uh, feel free to fire off a question or two if you have them. Uh, first question is why shouldn't fire it in the air? Well, I will tell you what happens when you fire any biopsy gun, there's a spring in here. Uh, spring, when you first set a spring, you're talking about kinetic energy. Every time you subsequently fire a spring or a needle, it gets weaker and weaker to the full of about 10 to 15 percent per firing. Uh, so if you have a biopsy device that you're going to use in a patient and it's sterile, and I fire it all the time, I fire it a couple times in the air, it can weaken the spring. Now, I like for me, I have a biopsy gun I literally use only for firing so that the patient can hear the sound. Um, but I do try not to fire these guns too much uh, because if you do fire them, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a singular spring in this type of device. And same thing with Cook or any of them, uh, they're a single spring. And the more times I fire it before being in the patient, the weaker that spring becomes. And when I'm dealing in cirrhotic tissue to begin with, it can be very difficult for these devices to sever the tissue. So the stronger the spring is, the better results I'm gonna have with regards to tip, uh, tissue separation and removing it out of the, the, uh, the liver. Um, DFU says, do not test the wire why. Uh, I'm assuming that's the same thing, Mr. Hans, that you're talking about uh, test firing it. Uh, and, the, and the reason is when you test fire a needle, and any company will tell you this, it's not just uh, 
germane to argon. Uh, almost every company will do this. When you do test wire the needle, uh, you are weakening the spring. So you will have a, a weakened needle. Uh, and if you do it too many times, if you fire two, three times outside of the body, every single time it gets exponentially weaker. And that's just the, unfortunately, the mechanism of action for any of these biopsy guns that are made is that they're made with a spring firing mechanism that can become weak. So that's why it says in most IFUs or DFUs not to test fire outside the body. Um, th there's the reasoning why. Uh, have you ever faced a problem with T-Lab when after first cut the needle does not load for a second cut? Um, I haven't personally seen that problem. What I can say is this, if you have a really acute bend, so if I take the needle and I bend it really sharp, when I go and I push the device down, what it can do is it can put friction in the system because that needle, as I'm pushing forward, there's a needle cannula that slides over the top. And if that pushes forward and there's too much friction on here, all these needles, doesn't matter who makes them, whether it be Bard, BD, Cook, whomever, they all have basically a spring with a, 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 an adhesant that holds the spring in place. Um, if you get too much pressure on here and you go and you, you push it, what can happen is you can snap that adhesant off the inside. And I've actually had this happen to me with a cooked needle before. Uh, so I have a personal experience. I actually opened up the needle on the table. You can actually snap that off and the little glue will snap where that, that uh, spring is and it won't allow you to be able to use the, the, the needle again. Plus, if you do have a really big angulation and a really big curve where you kind of placed a really, you know, one of these type of angulations on here, it becomes so acute that it can bend the system and not allow you to fire it because there's going to be too much friction on the needle for it to be able to fire properly. So that would be what could happen. Uh, like I said, there's many different things can happen in the body. Uh, but when I've had failures on needles uh, specifically, that tend to be the case is that I put too much of a bend on there and just kind of snap the needle, unfortunately, where it's adhesed. Uh, like I said, I can just share my, my experience personally on utilizing this and, and kind of troubleshoot a little bit. Uh, so I think I answered, I answered the, the four questions. Uh, is there any other questions anyone may have? Please feel free, I might give you a minute or two to, to go in the QA and, and by all means, what I will say is Mr. Hans, if you would, if anyone has any questions, if any of the physicians online have any questions, please feel free to give them my contact information. I'm more than happy to hop on a, an email or we can, we can uh, certainly uh, chat uh, you know, via phone conveyance. Uh, I have no problems at all answering any questions. Uh, again, let's record. Let me let me uh, let me see if my moderator can do that. Hey, Catherine. Hey. Yep. Are you able to open it up so uh, Mr. Abbe Kapoor could answer or can speak and ask a question? Are they able to uh, open up that speaker? Yes. Let me go in. And... Give us one second. I'm gonna see if I can open up your. Uh, your microphone so you can speak and we can discuss back and forth. Okay, he can uh, ask, I asked him to unmute so he can go ahead and unmute himself and speak. Okay, can you uh, uh, try? Hi. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Actually, I've been using T-Lab uh, for almost over a year now. And uh, initially we never had a problem, but off late, I, I would say in the last six months, Maybe I would say five out of 10 uh, guns have uh, given me this problem. After the first fire, it doesn't reload for a second fire. And this doesn't happen inside. When I, when I reload the needle to uh, dispel the sample, I realize after that, it's not locking. It's not ready to fire again. And okay, I've not like provided any acute angulations. There are no acute angulations inside. And at the same time, in the same angulation, if I have used a, a cook needle, it still gives me whatever number of samples I want. So this, there is something they know about this particular gun, which is causing this problem. If it happened just once, I would understand, but I have encountered it multiple times. So and what would- I, I've never air fired it. So two questions I have for you. When you pull the needle out, and so you, you cock the gun, it won't fire, you pull the needle out. When you have it outside of the system, are you able to cock it and fire it outside? No, it doesn't fire. Not at all. Okay, what, so basically what, I, and I've actually, 
have heard of that. They're, they're looking at it right now. We have an engineer that's kind of reverse engineering it and looking at that. Anytime a problem like that happens, especially if you used a gun for a long time and you haven't had the issue, we always want to make sure there's not a problem. And it, it, there's so many different things that can happen with these guns uh, that, you know, if you think about it, they have adhesive parts, they have different things that can sometimes uh, be a little wonky. Uh, so I do know that they basically, what we tend to do is when you have that issue, it gets brought up uh, through the system. I can tell you, I've actually heard of that uh, from the engineers that are reverse engineering it. So we will try to get your report on that. I'm just poor and see exactly what the, what the issue is. Um, but what tends to happen is a company needs to look at the device, completely reverse engineer it. So basically when you send in a device that's not working, uh, medical device companies by law are required to address that and look at what the root cause of that failure is. And so they, I know they're currently working on that and trying to figure out what that root cause is. Um, so I wish I can give you, you know, based on just not being there and seeing the case, it's hard for me to say, well, maybe it could be this, maybe it could be that. Um, you tell me you didn't put a big bend in there, you know, and, and it was used properly and you've been using it for some time. It's hard for me to make a diagnosis on what that root cause for failure would be. Um, so I, I, I will make sure, I will follow up personally and make sure that uh, you get an answer with regards to uh, what the findings would be, if that's acceptable to you. That would be great, uh, and, and it will be a big help because, you know, otherwise I'm very fond of T-Lab set because of the easy maneuverability and the plastic coating which the cannula has. So in early post-liver transplant patients, it's very easy to maneuver it into the freshly anastomosed right hepatic vein. Uh, but it's just because the problem which I'm facing with the biopsy needle that, you know, I'm now hesitant in using it. But I would love to come back to using it once this problem gets sorted out. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much. You know, more than anything, I can tell you, when you go from clinical practice and you go on the other side and you start working with a medical device company, it's interesting to see how these processes are worked through. Uh, and I didn't know that until I came over and started doing some consulting uh, to get involved in these processes and see how you reverse engineer things and how we answer when devices are not working. It's, it's interesting to see the side of it, uh, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, from just doing clinical practice. So I, I will personally make sure that you get someone reaching out to you to make sure that whatever answers we find from an engineering perspective are relayed to you, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions uh, this evening? I, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I never, it's never easy. You guys are taking time out of your practice, out of being with family uh, to, to hop on this and, and spend some time uh, talking uh, T-Lab and transjugular. So I just wanted to thank everybody uh, specifically for, for doing that and spending the time with us this evening. Uh, hopefully I gave you some tips and tricks that help. Uh, if you haven't tried the device, I hope you get a chance to get it in your hand and give it a try. It really is a, a neat uh, device uh, and, and an upgrade, certainly in my opinion, from something that we've historically used since the 1980s without any change to the technology. Uh, so I really do hope that uh, uh, you guys get a chance to, uh, to get a chance to, uh, to look at that. And let me see. They, they want a standalone needle. Is there any chance to get a standalone needle? I will bring that up to the, the management um, and the executive management team to see if that they could actually sell the needle separate. Uh, that's something to talk about. I, I, I can't answer that question. I wish I could give you an answer about whether they can make the needle separate and just have the needle available. But I will. I definitely will mention that that's been something that that has been feedback that uh, physicians would be interested in doing. That's kind of my job. I get to uh, bring all the questions that, that my colleagues have and bring them up to Argonne and and, and uh, you know express what we think would be best uh, with regards to these devices. And so what I will say is, anybody have any questions at all, please feel free to uh, reach out to Mr. Hans, uh, who is our representative in India. I'm more than happy to answer. I hop on a phone call with you. We can FaceTime or do another ring meeting. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to getting back to India. Uh, I enjoyed the last trip I was over there and got to meet some of you, hopefully. And uh, hopefully we'll get it to see you guys again soon. Uh, I miss the travel and I miss seeing my colleagues. So it'll be nice to hopefully be able to do that. Um, anyway, thank you everybody. Uh, many blessings and, and I appreciate you for, for hopping on this evening. Please go enjoy your evening, enjoy your family, and I look forward to seeing everybody soon. Please feel free to reach out. And Mr. Hans, give them my um, contact information to anybody that may want it. I'm more than happy to address anything personally. And like I said, I'm always always up for a phone call or, or a FaceTime message. I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody.